Great. Hello and welcome and good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending Helping Parents Move Beyond Their Own ACEs. We're so excited to bring a subject matter expert to you today um, that we know she is near and dear to us. Her name is Natalie Elms. So Natalie, if you wouldn't mind, please advance me to the next screen and then I will pass it over to you. I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about Natalie before we begin. So Natalie's clinical background is based in behavior therapy and she works in various roles supporting children of all abilities for 20 years. She's been involved in grant funded programs at Rady Children's Hospital since 2012 and is currently the manager for the Kid Start Center. Natalie's passion is finding creative ways to meet the clinical needs of young children with complex needs. And with that, I wanna pass it over and say thank you so much for being with us today, Natalie. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be able to present to you all today via Caltrin. So welcome to our presentation. If you are here to learn about um, helping caregivers through their own ACEs, you're in the right place. Today we're going to be talking about adverse childhood experience screenings, understanding how a caregivers experience impacts their parenting, and learning a little bit more about how we can support caregivers who are impacted by adverse childhood experiences. I love the icebreaker question that Jessica asked because I got to see a little bit more about how you all learned about adverse childhood experiences and I'm so glad that you all bring this knowledge with you today and I hope we can learn a little bit more and that I can learn a little bit from you as well. So many of you mentioned that you've seen or heard of Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. So Dr. Burke Harris was the first Surgeon General of California, and she was an amazing advocate to increase understanding about the impact of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and toxic stress. And her work has really ignited more conversations about early childhood mental health. At KidStart, we've been screening for adverse childhood experiences for since 2013 for both children and for caregivers. The boxes on this slide represent the adverse childhood experiences that are commonly screened for, including abuse, neglect, and household challenges. Risk factors for people endorsing four or more ACEs include long-term physical health, mental health, and social problems as an adult. So at KidStart, one in three KidStart children report an ACE of four or higher, and this is compared with one in 10 in the US. So you can see we're supporting a very high needs population, which means we have a huge opportunity to make changes. KidStart's working to change the trajectory of these young children and support the caregivers to understand the impact of their own ACE form. So to break this down a little bit further, these graphs represent the ACE screenings for caregivers and children at KidStart. The purple bubbles represent the general population, and then left to right, the blue bars represent the ACE score, starting with a score of zero on the far left, one to three ACEs in the middle, and four or more ACEs on the right. You can see that KidStart children and parents report substantially higher ACEs than are reported in the general population. And about half of Kids Start parents or caregivers report four or more ACEs, which is three times higher than the general population. So it's not just that their young children have high ACE scores, the caregivers themselves are bringing high ACE scores. So how can we help these families? So just to give you a little background for anyone that isn't familiar with Kids Start, and Jessica has a um, handout just a brochure that shares a little bit more about Kids Start, but what are we doing differently as a program? Um, so as a program, Kids Start is supporting children who have complex needs. And what that means for us is we're looking at, we're, we're looking to determine eligibility by looking at four areas of a child's life, their development, their behavioral health, their physical health, and their family functioning. So child appropriate for Kids Start may be accessing speech services, but isn't making the gains that we would expect them to. They might've been kicked out of multiple preschools and had prenatal exposure to alcohol. This child's needs are complex because a number of factors could be contributing to the challenges that they're having. And that's what would make them appropriate for Kids Start. All the children that we support in our program are under six years old, so this is all young children as well. We're taking a transdisciplinary approach. And what that means for us is that our treatment involves a high degree of collaboration 
many of the kids that we're supporting haven't made gains in traditional therapy models. And that collaboration is really important for them to be able to make gains, which includes wrapping the caregiver into their treatment. We have a trauma-informed team all the way through every single member of our team. That includes um, the person that families see at the front desk when they walk in, the psychologist, all of our social workers and care coordinators. Um, even our evaluation team attends regular, regular trainings on being trauma-informed. And we're gonna talk a lot about that today. Um, we hold caregiver mental health. Caregiver mental health is very important. We know if we don't hold parents, they can't help their young children. And so we screen families for depression and anxiety. We screen caregivers for depression and anxiety every six months. We'll help families connect to services that they would like to. And we make sure that families know that this is a conversation that we're open to having with them. We're coordinating with the child's entire circle of care. So this means that Every child at KidStart has a care coordinator who's coordinating with that circle of care, and that circle of care is everyone involved actively in that child's life. So it could be medical specialists, county social workers, um, it could be different government-funded providers that are working with the family, and grandma. Just everyone who's wrapped around this family to support this child, we want to make sure we're all on the same page and that we're breaking down any barriers that this family may be accessing. So let's dive a little bit deeper into what trauma-informed care means for us. So being trauma-informed as a team is a key factor to supporting caregivers with high ACE scores. In order for us to support caregivers, we have to make sure that we support our care coordinators because the caregivers that they support are often as complex as the children that they bring to our program. In order to support our caregivers, the care coordination team has weekly group supervision with a licensed clinical social worker, monthly individual supervision with the licensed clinical social worker, and then they have twice monthly group supervision with a psychologist. This seems like a lot, but our kids are complex and we're looking at not just behavior, but also development. A component of this supervision is reflective practice because it's important to hold that space so that the care coordinators can work through the impact of working with caregivers with hiatus and process their own reactions to some of the things that they have to support families through. Through intensive services, our care coordinators are able to hold the family's backstory and to make sure that the team addresses any barriers that the family has to making progress, which could be financial barriers, housing instability, um, it could be an understanding of their child's development, any barriers that the family brings, we're able to help them work, we're here to help them work through. Team members meet regularly to share clinical impressions and share strategies and problem solving through barriers so that the child's able to make progress. We have a meeting that we call our hot potato meeting, which all of the providers attend and have kind of mini case consultations. This happens once a month. Um, and we identify in those mini case consultations if someone is a hot potato, meaning they have kind of a crisis that we need to address or something urgent, if they are mashed potatoes, which means a crisis might be brewing, we want to intervene, or if it's chips, we just need to connect. So we have a, a cute name for that really important meeting that we have. Um, and then we also are just completing ongoing trainings through conferences, internal trainings. We bring speakers in. We feature our team members providing more training. That ongoing training is so important because you're never just trauma-informed. It's an ongoing process. And so what does this look like in action? So I actually just reflected in preparing for this training this weekend on a case that just came to us. So this family was referred to us, and um, it looked like it was the child had autism and it was very clear cut and they were to be connected to autism services instead of being triaged into our program. Well, at first glance, that's what it looked like, but they came back with a little boomerang and it was very clear that this child did have complex needs and would benefit from KidStart. And so we were really lucky that we were able to kind of bring the team together that was currently supporting this child. So, um, they weren't accessing any services at KidStart yet, but they were accessing services, other speech services, physical therapy services. We were able to connect with the pediatrician and we brought this whole team together. And um, it, was, it was kind of an eye-opening moment for me because I do presentations and I talk about us being trauma-informed. When we were talking to the team, I could really see 
how important it was to look at this family through a trauma-informed lens. This family had housing insecurity, they had food insecurity, they, um, the mom had, uh, this was her, she had many children and this was the only one that was currently in her care. We had no idea what the backstory was there. And just talking to the team that was supporting her, they all had the child's best interest and the family's best interest at heart, but they weren't thinking about what the what the how that past experience had impacted that child's relationship and the mom's relationship with that child what anxiety was driving the, some of the decisions that mom was making and the reason she might be calling time after time or having trouble being discharged and why she wasn't able to connect to some services for example the child had been recommended ada services but due to the family's housing situation they wouldn't be able to have ada services come into their home and that was creating a challenge for mom to find a provider. So it gave me an opportunity to kind of reflect on how important that trauma informed lens is by talking to other providers who I highly respect and I know they're all great providers, but who weren't looking at the family through the lens that we look through them at a kid start. So then we also have to consider administration factors in supporting families who have a high A scores. So due to the complexity of the population that we're supporting, our care coordinators come to the team with a lot of clinical experience and participate in regular training on best practices in early childhood development and mental health needs of caregivers. This includes things like motivational interviewing, best practices in administering mental health measures, crisis assessment and intervention, and more. Our program is always taking a comprehensive approach to care and the reason it, and that is one of the reasons that all physicians are trained on providing trauma-informed care this creates a really safe environment for our caregivers and the children experiencing shame can be a big deterrent to caregivers accessing services for their children and the kids start team takes a really goal oriented approach with families and normalizes having needs this helps families to feel a little bit more understood and supported throughout the process. Care coordinators assist in finding appropriate resources for the specific needs of caregivers that they identify, and they take an active approach to guiding the caregiver along through the process. So this might be making a phone call with them or helping them prepare for a meeting. And care coordinators take every opportunity to educate caregivers on the impact of adverse experiences on development and mental health in young children. This is done at the caregiver's pace. So the first step for families at Kid Start is the home-based assessment. So once a child is identified as being complex, then they're going to meet with one of our care coordinators to do a home-based assessment. So this is with a licensed or pre-licensed social worker, which for our family facing name that we call them as care coordinators. Um, and the home-based assessment has historically always taken place in the child's home. However, we should have renamed it for COVID because we were doing them by Zoom and we're doing kind of a blended model now depending on the comfort level of the family. And so in preparing for this appointment, the care coordinator is gonna look at the child's developmental report and really review their medical record and any services that they've been accessing and any information that we have on this family because we don't want the family to have to kind of repeat their story, but having that background information is gonna help us to navigate conversations with the family. The care coordinator in this home-based assessment is going, to, is going to assess caregiver mental health by administering the PHQ-9 depression scale and the GAD-7 anxiety scale. They also complete the caregiver ACE. So pre-COVID, we actually would do the caregiver ACE in the developmental evaluation that the psychologist would do. But throughout COVID, we realized that, well, at some point our developmental evaluations were done via Zoom at the beginning of the pandemic, and we just had to cut a few things. And so the caregiver ACE was one of them, and we flipped that over to be on the care coordinator's plate. And we realized that screening for adverse childhood experiences with the caregiver um, opened a conversation when we would then do the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 depression and anxiety screenings, because then we were talking about depression and anxiety, and we could relate it back to those adverse childhood experiences and help the family kind of understand and process a little bit more how that's going to impact their parenting or impact themselves or their perception of their child. 
Um, so all of this gives the parent or caregiver an opportunity to share their history. And it's really important for us to understand what their history is because this is going to shape their parenting. It also helps us to understand their perspective of their history. So a lot of that is kind of what's normal for them. What have they experienced? What, what do they expect? What are their expectations? All of this is going to shape their parenting and it tells us a lot about the family and where they're coming from so that we can meet them where they are. Um, with that being said, we also have to acknowledge with caregivers that they're sharing sensitive information. It can be difficult, it can be awkward. Sometimes the first time we screen a family, they might not share everything. But in six months when we screen them again and we've got to know them and they've come to trust us a bit more, they might share a little bit more information. Um, we, we acknowledge that this can be awkward for families. And you know, for example, if there's a pause in conversation, we might say, I know this is hard. You don't have to tell us everything at once. And just try to create a really safe and accepting environment so the families feel comfortable sharing. And that's just step one of developing that trusting relationship. The home-based assessment, when we're doing it in home, also enables us to assess the family environment and the circle of care. So we're looking at who are the primary caregivers, who's, who are the family members in the household, um, what supports do they have, and what is their role in the child's life. This initial appointment is also for us to identify any potential barriers that the family has to accessing services. So they could be concrete barriers like transportation or more or more um, subjective barriers like caregivers' mental health. So just to step back to my previous example, how did we complete this home-based assessment? We really wanted to see the environment that this family was living in, but we knew that this family was renting one bedroom and a home, um, and we'd already kind of identified that as being one of the barriers. So we did ask the family if we could book home-based assessment, and they shared with us that um, she wasn't able to have anyone come into her home because her landlord had very strict rules. She was worried because her child's behavior had impacted her finding housing and had got them kicked out of previous housing. And so this told us a lot about the family. It told us that, you know, this landlord has set a rule and the mom is, is very anxious about maintaining her housing and making sure that she doesn't lose this housing because of behavior or not breaking this rule. It, was kind of vulnerable of the mom to be able to share that and tell us that she had lost housing previously because of her child's behavior. So we we took that information and we were able to meet with the family on site in order to do the home-based assessment. And so we did the measures that we needed to complete there. But that whole interaction, you know, thinking about it through a trauma-informed lens and thinking about what this means for the child to be able to access different services helped us to understand what this family was presenting with so that we can, again, meet them where they are and help them take next steps on their journey. So kind of jumping back to data and thinking about um, who's completing this ACE screening. So about 50% of the children at KidStart are involved in child welfare. That number actually has gone up since the pandemic started. It used to be, you know, a handful of years ago, it was closer to, it was around 30% and now we're at 50%. And we know that about 50% of children involved in child welfare are reunified with their parents. This number goes down for children with a diagnosed disability. So at KidStart, from the very beginning, we're always working to engage the child's parents and caregivers. If children are going to reunify with their parents, it's extremely important for them to understand their child's needs and how they can support. For our ACE screenings, we, try, we always try to have the parent complete the screening because that gives us the most accurate information. And we're able to do that about 73% of the time. You can see the next largest category is a relative caregiver. So that would be someone who is related to the child's parent. So that also is pretty good information. And the smallest group is the group that would probably have the least direct information about the child, which would be a non-relative caregiver. This data set includes all surveys that have complete data. So any survey that we've administered that had more than two unknown weren't included. So sometimes we'll have a caregiver who just met the child and doesn't have a lot of background information. And so they might kind of go through the screening and say, unknown, unknown, unknown. And then we're able to, we don't include that information because it doesn't really give us a good picture. Um, so one example of 
kind of this in action again is we worked with a family who had two very young children who were removed and they were the children were actually placed in different homes. It was incredibly hard to include the biological parents in any of the meetings or treatment that we were having. They both were really struggling with substance abuse issues and they and mental health issues. They'd relapsed multiple times. Um, in some cases, they didn't want to be involved, but we persisted over a year, involving this family, reaching out to them, letting them know when appointments were happening, inviting them to be part of our meetings, um, attending different child welfare meetings. The younger of the two children was placed in an amazing home where the caregiver was aware of and understood how to navigate some of the medical challenges, developmental challenges, and behavioral health challenges that this child was presenting with. They, that caregiver also was really amazing in that she was always open to having the biological parents involved. And through this persistence, um, the, the mom really, she, she did relapse a couple times, she had trouble, but all of a sudden she started coming to meetings. And at first she'd come to meetings and she'd forget when appointments were. And then we saw her coming to meetings and she would start taking notes. And then she had a consistent notebook that she would bring. And this mom was really able to engage in services over time and take care of herself and her own treatment and was able to reunify with her child who did have complex needs and she understood those needs by the time that they reunified. So this was a, an amazing story of a family who really was struggling when they first came to us, but throughout over uh, throughout about 18 months of services, we were able to engage the biological parent and support them understanding the needs, involve them in services and see kind of what a great success that can be. So how do caregivers' experiences impact child outcomes, child treatment outcomes? This, so just diving a little bit into treatment. Um, adverse childhood experience of the caregiver shapes their whole view of what's normal in different ways. So we hear a lot of parents say, I was like this as a child. This is exactly what I did. And look, I turned out fine. We've all heard people say that before. Um, and so maybe the caregiver comes from a very successful family and has really high or unrealistic expectations of their child causing them anxiety. And working with a caregiver with significant mental health needs, for example, um, trauma, a significant trauma history or depression, they might interpret their child's behaviors as intentional and thinking that impulsivity and hyperactivity are purposeful actions against them. So we have to work through that. So again, we always are looking to meet families where they are and help them take next steps from there. The bottom line is that we're considering their perspective. One way this is done is by asking families, what does good look like to you? What can we do to best support you? These questions apply to goals for their child, but they can also be used to determine how we can best support them. Many, um, many caregivers with mental health needs, when we ask what good, what that we ask about connecting them to mental health services, a lot of people think, well, if they have mental health needs, the next step should be connecting them to mental health services. But you might be surprised to hear how many families say, how am I supposed to go to mental health services when this is going on with my child? I have 10 appointments for my child in a week and you want me to add another one for me? And if we're meeting them where they are, that sounds like pretty reasonable. If you have young children and you're you know, trying to do all of these things, it, it could be really challenging for you to get to mental health services. If we're meeting the family where they are, then we have to kind of hear that and understand, all right, we need to help this family get to the next step. Um, it's kind of a one-size-fits-all approach to think that behavior is, or to think that them engaging in their own mental health services is the next step, but they have to be ready for that and they have to be open to it. Um, and so we have to help families kind of think through as we gain trust with them and develop that relationship with them, what could it look like? So maybe they could go to the gym and their child could be in the child watch that's at the gym. A lot of gyms have child watch. Maybe that's a way that they can start to take care of themselves while also having childcare for their child. So thinking through these options is important and what does that self-care or that um, mental health support look like for them? 
providing mental health education is really crucial. And so we talk a lot about self-care and co-regulation. It's really important that the caregiver understand um, and they have to take care of themselves in order to take the best care of their child. So there's two analogies that come to mind when I share that. One is that the oxygen mask, you, everyone has probably heard a flight attendant say, you know, if in case of an emergency, put your oxygen mask on first and then put your child's oxygen mask on. And I think it's a really good analogy when we think about taking care of our own mental health, because unless you are taking care of yourself or that caregiver is taking care of themselves, they really can't be all that they can be for their child and everyone wants to give their child the best. Um, the other, another great analogy is you can't build a house without a stable foundation. And so families have to find ways to take care of themselves, put their oxygen mask on first, create that stable foundation so that they can be the best that they can for their child. Um, in addition to helping families kind of think through this, we are doing depression and anxiety screenings every six months. But we're also screening in different ways. So the, the care coordinators are attending appointments, attending IEP meetings, attending um, different therapy appointments or medical specialist appointments with the caregivers and helping the caregivers through those appointments. We're always assessing for depression and anxiety and making sure that the family is doing okay. So while we do these formal screenings, we're always informally screening as well and looking for any kind of red flags. We validate any any efforts that the parents are making toward um, a, the goal of establishing better self-care and establishing good mental health for themselves. And we celebrate no matter how small the step is because we know it's really hard for parents to be able to take that step. That um, that relationship and that trust is so is so important and can make a huge difference and normalizing challenges. And one example um, that was really difficult for our team, but it, it's a great example of that trusting relationship is we had a family who had really significant substance abuse history and she relapsed and she called her care coordinator after she had been drinking and she had the kids in the car. She actually pulled over on the side of the road and the first phone call she made was her care coordinator and her care, she told her, I, I relapsed, I was drinking, I have the kids in the car. And she knew that the care coordinator was going to have to call the police and going to have to make a child welfare report. But she also knew that our care coordinator would say, I'm really glad you called. I'm really sorry this happened, but you made the right choice and be thoughtful in the approach and have a trauma-informed approach to taking the next steps. So while that is, you know, a really hard thing to work through, that we were the first phone call when that mom needed help and she trusted her care coordinator to be able to help her through the next steps and that's just really important she knew she wouldn't be judged she would be helped there we go sorry my slide was stuck so of course this makes us think about the thinking about caregivers aces makes us think about kind of that generational impact of trauma and we see that in many of our kids to our families and we know that parents want better for their young children regardless of your socioeconomic background or your a score every parent wants a better life for their child and to create the best life that they can for their child so when you look at this data, you see a breakdown of the adverse experiences endorsed on this child screening and on the caregiver screening. And then across the bottom, you can see the specific adverse experiences. So I think these graphs really illustrate that parents do want a better life for their children. The red circle shows that caregivers endorsed much higher rates of abuse for themselves than they did for their young children. And you can see that the rates of abuse they endorse for themselves, the red, the part under the red circle are emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional neglect. So these are kind of more direct abuse. But when you look at the rates for um, kind of more environmental abuse, so parental separation, IPV is intimate partner violence or domestic violence, alcohol and substance abuse, mental illness, and incarceration, you see really similar rates of endorsement for parents and for children. Parents are trying to do better, but 
this is their normal. This is the environment they grew up in. It's the environment their children are growing up in. And for a lot of our families, when we do depression and anxiety screenings, they might say, well, I, I, parents say, I, did, I didn't do very good on this one. I, did, I failed my depression screening, which isn't a thing, but <laughs> it is something that we hear from families. But this is what they've experienced. And that's why I said that doing the caregiver ACE screening and pairing it with the depression and the anxiety screening enables us to have a conversation about you, you can feel better. Yes, you did endorse a lot of things on this screening. You are showing high levels of anxiety. You could feel better. You could, this could be different. And so helping families to understand how they can understand a little bit more how the experiences that they had a, as a child have impacted them, they're very motivated then to want something better for their children. And this just helps us to have that conversation, to start a conversation that we have the entire time families are here at Kidstart. We're always helping parents to reflect back on why they did things or why they interpreted something some way, because that helps them on their journey to be the best parent that they can for their child. Um, I just I just like had a peek at the question. So I, I, how are these treatments billed? Is Medi-Cal covering these treatments or assessments? Is such a great question. Um, so Kidstart is very lucky to be able to leverage insurance every step of the way that we can, but we have grant funding that fills in any gaps that we have. So I bet. I bet that you were thinking that this couldn't all be billed to Medi-Cal and you're 100% right. And care coordination is not billed at all right now. We're not able to bill for anything. They're fully covered by grants, which we're so thankful to have the support of Promises to Kids and First Five um, San Diego. So Kidstart also administers the, um, the Child Behavior Checklist or the CBCL at intake to better understand the child's social emotional needs and behavioral needs. And we find that across all of the CBCL domains, which are externalizing, internalizing, and total problems. So this is all externalizing behavior, internalizing behavior, and total problems. Children with higher A scores score significantly higher on this measure than kids who have an A score of under four. And for parents who have experienced their own trauma, understanding their child's behavior can be a real challenge. We hear many families talk about how their child knows better, or they're doing this in spite of their parents, or they're doing this for no reason. And so helping parents to understand that behavior is a form of communication provides a new lens to view challenging behaviors. The behavior is an ill intent, it's communicating a need, and we need to work together to understand that need in order to address the behavior. This lens is so important to understand in order to support decreasing challenging behavior. It's a starting point for parents to be able to build their own toolbox to understand behavior, to model positive behavior strategies, and to understand teaching emotions. We work with a child who had prenatal exposure, developmental delays, and a lot of challenging behaviors. His grandfather was doing his best, but he just did not understand his child's behavior. You could tell he loved his grandson so much, but he was just distraught over the violence of his behavior. Our occupational therapist, mental health therapist, and behavior specialist work closely together to help this grandfather understand his grandchild's behavior, to be able to see the signs that his child was escalating, and to understand how the trauma that his child had experienced was impacting him. So at one point during his time at Kidstart, he said to the behavior specialist, but I don't see what you see. You tell me that you see the signs that he's escalating and I just don't recognize them. You see him different. This was very vulnerable of the grandfather to share. And it gave us an opportunity to kind of pause and think about how we were delivering the treatment for this child. So we switched things up. So obviously we needed to. So the occupational therapist and the behavior specialist were co-treating in our gym. And we instead had grandpa move out of the room so that he was behind the one-way mirror. He could focus a bit better. He could see everything, but he wasn't right in it. And so it gave him an opportunity to be kind of the silent observer. 
and to really focus on his child's behavior. We also pulled the care coordinator in to sit with him. So we wrote on a post-it and stuck it on the one-way mirror what our goal was for that therapy session. And then the care coordinator would sit with him and walk him through and help him to understand and point out different strategies that were be used, being used to support that one goal that was on a post-it on the window. And this really helped grandpa to be able to focus and understand and see some of those yellow flags before we became in the in a red zone. Um, being able to switch things up, being able to co-treat, being able to listen and, you know, be vulnerable ourselves of, hey, this isn't working. We need to do something different. And change our treatment program is what enabled this grandfather to really start to see the signs that his child was escalating, which was huge because his child was very destructive when he be, when he escalated and being able to catch it before he got to that point was incredibly important. And this was a child who, asked, who went from zero to 100 in no time, but if you could catch him at like 80, it took him a long time to really come back down and grandpa learned to be able to see that. And it really helped the child, not only to be more successful at home, but to be more successful at school. Grandpa felt more confident. It was really a win-win for everyone. So in terms of treatment considerations, we've talked a lot about the trusting relationship and that trusting relationship is so important. Um, and so we have, we had a family, so a, a case example of this in practice would be, we had a family who at check-in, our patient access representative, um, was a little bit worried that a family, that the parent that came in was intoxicated. And so she had shared that with the care coordinator instead of actioning anything or instead of assuming that she was intoxicated because of that trauma-informed training, she reached out to the care coordinator who came down to greet the parent. The, the parent was able to share that something right before they came into session had really triggered them in their own trauma history and they were really having a hard time and upset about it. And it, it was presenting like the like they were intoxicated. And so they were able to kind of talk through that crisis and manage it and work through it and help that family. And if the um, if they hadn't had that trusting relationship, the parent wouldn't have been able to share that. But also if the patient access rep had really assumed that she was intoxicated, it could have created another traumatic event for the family. Um, so we're really kind of thankful that that played out the way that it did. Another example, of kind of developing that that trusting relationship as kind of reading the situation. We had a family who came in for a triage evaluation with a psychologist and the mother disclosed um, disclosed thoughts about self-harm, self-harm and a history of hallucinations. So at this time the program manager and the care coordinator were both called in. We moved mom to a separate room to evaluate and understand the safety plan um, so that the evaluation with the child could continue. Mom did have significant mental health concerns and was very, and was able to kind of share a safety plan that she had in place and what that looked like. The program manager ran to call the mental health therapist to confirm the safety plan and make sure that everyone was on the same page and we had a plan and that really the way that that was worked through helped that care coordinator to develop a trusting relationship from the beginning and to really understand the role of mom's mental health and where we needed to start with this family. Um, some of you are likely familiar with the, the role of regulation and the program, the zones of regulation. So one component of Kid Start is to, so the zones of regulation is helping to kind of bring a child appropriate framework to regulation. So when you think about regulation, someone could be, um, the being green would mean that you're kind of ready to learn and ready to focus and attend and share and take in information. In the yellow zone, I kind of think of that as me before I have coffee in the morning, you might you might be kind of tired, you might be kind of slower, you might not be as ready to share. And the red zone would be you can't take in information, you can't effectively communicate, you might be internalizing or externalizing. So you could be sitting in the corner not saying anything or you could be tearing the house down. Um, 
but understanding the role of regulation, not just for the children that we support, but also for the caregivers to understand their own regulation is really important at Get Start. And we are working again with very young children. And so we talk a lot about co-regulation in early childhood and parents helping parents to understand that they need to work through their child, they need to work through regulation with their child and that young children are going to co-regulate. They're going to crawl up in your lap and need a hug when they're, um, you know, starting to escalate and being able to identify this child is, is starting to escalate. I need to help them to become more regulated again. So that's a, a huge part of our program for parents to be able to understand that. And an example of kind of working through this with the caregivers, we worked with a family who had a lot of anxiety about the individualized education plan with their school um, and that the team that was working on that with their child. So they were really nervous and really anxious about the school being able to support their child. They invested a lot in early intervention and they just wanted to make sure that they were setting their daughter up for success. Um, and so the care coordinator asked them, what things do you do to keep yourself green to stay regulated so that you can advocate for your child? And the mom said that as soon as she gets upset, she just starts forgetting things. So they were able to kind of pr prime the meeting of the things that they, they wanted to talk about. They had a list ready to go when they went into the meeting. And then they also were worried about the team not focusing on the child and kind of being in a battle with the parent. And so they made a little collage of their daughter and pictures of their daughter and they passed it out in the meeting so that everyone could stay focused on their daughter. And I think this is just a really nice example of, you know, we talk about regulation with kids, but when we're working with families who have um, kind of their own challenges that they're bringing to the table, it's very important that we can help them problem solve through that as well. And that family was really thankful and actually had a great IEP meeting. So they were, I think part of that was setting them up for success. Um, we talk a lot about the role of executive functioning at KidStart because many of the children that we support have challenges with executive functioning skills. So when you think about executive functioning skills, it's really a group of skills that help us to organize and manage our daily tasks. Um, and so we have a group called Function Junction at KidStart, which there is a child component where the kids are with OT, speech, and a behavior specialist. And then our mental health therapist does a parent education component with the parent. And then at the end of group, we come together and we get to kind of put into play what the parents have just learned about and help them see how they can support their children coping through some executive functioning challenges. So my favorite class of this group is when we talk about impulsivity and impulse control. And many of our kids have challenges with impulse control. So they have the mental health part of it where they're in the parent education group. And then when the parents join group, we play Simon Says. Simon Says is a childhood game that everyone knows where if Simon says, put your hand on your head, then you put your hand on your head. But if you say, put your hand on your head, you have to recognize that Simon didn't say it. And when any kids are playing this game, the fun of it is that you don't touch that. But with kids who have executive functioning challenges, it's just, it, it's a nice example because a lot of families think she's just not listening. I tell her to put her shoes on and she's not listening to me. She doesn't want to put her shoes on. I tell her to sit down. She doesn't sit down. We have to get in the car. We have to go somewhere. We have to get, we have to, get to school or whatever. Um, so when we play this game, they see, they see the kids be able to, um, they, they, they know that the children, they, they've just learned about impulse control. And so when they don't say Simon says, they can see the look on the kids' faces that says, you know, I heard that they didn't say Simon says, but my body took off. There's that disconnect. And so parents get to see their kids' behavior through a different lens. It's not something that they're doing to them. It's not because they want it to take off. They want to play the game and do what's right. And it's just such a nice way to point out to parents that this isn't bad behavior. This is impulse control. We might need to slow down. We might need to tell your child once. We might need to minimize distractions in order for the child to be successful and listen. And so I think it's just such a nice illustration of modeling skills for families and helping them to see behavior through a different lens. And then we do a lot of skill building. So we recognize that um, the caregiver's mental health needs, they, we, they need support in coming up with effective strategies. And if 
families feel like they're headed on a downward spiral, we have to think, we have to help caregivers think through what can they do to make sure their them and their child stay afloat. Um, and so normalizing and joining caregivers to help them feel less judged is really important and giving them those skills so, so they feel confident going into different meetings and advocating for their child and um, supporting them to know that they, they do know what's best for their child. If they have concerns, they, they should be listened to. And how do they advocate and how do they present those concerns? So that skill building piece is part of, again, going back to, it's not like a broken record, but meeting families where they are and helping them to kind of scaffold and build on the skills that they have so that they can be confident with skill building. Um, okay, so you guys have heard me talk a lot <laughs> and thank you all for listening, but I would love to hear from you. So I put up on the screen, there's a Q, you can use this QR code or you can go to menti.com and enter the code. Um, and it's gonna pull up a question. So we're gonna we're gonna go into some breakout groups. Um, you're gonna be in breakout groups for about 10 minutes, and there's two questions to discuss. So I can come back to this slide, but the two questions are how are you holding the caregivers experience in your own program? And are there things you would be different, you would do differently moving forward? So you can discuss both questions in your breakout rooms. And on the on the ment when you go to menti.com, the first question will be there asking you to, um, and you can put in your answers. So you can put your answers to the first questions in on menti.com. And then when you come back, we'll have a discussion about the second question. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all had great discussions in your breakout group. I have loved seeing all your responses and I hope you can all see them on the screen. Um, I would love, I don't, hopefully, hopefully you're still here and you can hear me, but I would love to hear more about the Check and Connect program that someone shared. If you wouldn't mind unmuting and sharing a little bit more if you're comfortable, totally okay if you're not too. We heard lots, um, there was a lot of responses about people might not be doing adverse childhood experience screenings per se, but they are implement or getting that information in different ways. And a lot of responses about psychoeducation and different education programs, um, supporting families to understand adverse childhood experiences and introducing them to the idea. Um, and lots which just, honestly makes me feel good to hear all these other programs are meeting families where they are and making sure that they're a safe place and not a judgmental place for families. So thank you all of you for sharing those experiences and how you're holding this in your program. So the other question we were looking at is what would you do differently or what would you like to do differently? Um, and so I'm going to actually flip to the next question. And if you guys wouldn't mind putting into Menti the things that you would do differently, I'd love for us all to be able to see those. And then this will be sent out with the presentation notes. So if you guys wouldn't mind kind of hopping back on your phone and entering those things so we can all see them, that would be awesome. I put the link back in the chat too. So provide more ongoing post services support. Reducing the stigma, I love that. definitely need to get to a place where we can all talk about mental health and it's okay. Intentionally discussing ACEs. Sharing information with all caregivers. I think that's a really important one because I think sometimes that people attribute adverse childhood experiences to being families who are 
the more disadvantaged families and it's not, it's everyone. <laughs> um, people can have ACEs and high socioeconomic statuses too. Oh, that's a nice share, learning how ACEs is contributing to my parenting. So thinking about how we reflecting on our own situations. Bringing in families sooner, that's something that we're looking to do too, to support more infants and looking even at um, high-risk families who are expecting. Wow, thank you all for sharing. I really appreciate it. I love seeing what everyone's doing. Understanding that caregivers don't see what providers see. It's a good takeaway. Well, thank you all so much for everything that you are sharing here. This is great. So the answers to both of the questions that were shared will be sent out with everyone and I'm going to flip back to the presentation now and we'll have an opportunity for you guys to ask questions. You're welcome to put them in the chat. Um, so do I have the link for the study done by Kaiser? I don't have that link handy, but we could potentially send it out. We also, the ACE data that we've collected at KidStart is in the process of being published. So keep your eyes open for that. How do you negotiate child welfare timeframes while staying in the trauma-informed perspective? That is a great question. Um, I'm often thankful that we aren't child welfare, but that is the, the timeframes are hard to, they're really hard to negotiate. But I think that our role with child welfare when we're working with families is sometimes to help the protective service worker, the child welfare social worker, um, reflect a bit. We recently had a case where a parent's rights were being terminated and the social worker had changed four times. And we were able to kind of reflect with the current social worker who had just been assigned the case, um, just through asking questions about why parents' rights were being terminated, which isn't our decision at all, but it, they were genuine questions that our care coordinator was asking just based on how we navigate cases. And what came to light as a result of that conversation was that mom hadn't had the opportunity to attend any appointments, that mom wasn't being invited or didn't know about when appointments were happening. So there was kind of this misnomer that that had been happening and it, it ended up changing the time frame. So, we didn't do anything necessarily to change the time frame, except for bring light to something that people just didn't realize was happening. That is a challenge though. What are the common screenings we use to assess for ACEs? Can we sure send the PDFs? So actually, if you go to acesaware.com, we are using the PEARLS, which is the pediatric version of the ACE screening. And then we're using um, just a modified version of that, that for caregivers. So we're using the one that's on the it's acesaware.com. I'll put it in the chat. Oh, and thanks to whoever put the link to the study in there. But acesaware.com has what we're using on it. Are there any other questions? It's the pediatric, the per so what's the pearls again? The pearls is the pediatric version of the ACE screening. Um, when Dr. Nadine Burke Harris kind of brought light to, got it, thanks Karen. Um, when she kind of brought light to doing ACE screenings, one of the things that she changed in California was that she made it billable to do an ACE screening. And so we can bill Medi-Cal for ACE screenings. And in order to kind of make that billable, she standardized, there's the sta a standardized ACE screening that people use that is billable, which is the PEARLS. And she created a standardized training for providers. And just recently, a law passed that commercial insurance has to pay for ACE screenings in California too. So I think that that alone, making it billable, 
makes more people be able to create the time to do it. And there is a quick um, kind of domino effect of that is of that we all have to be looking at early childhood mental health. Which we were doing for a while at KidStar, but it's nice to have more support. We're going to find more information about about how high caregiver racist scores affect their pair. Where could you find more information? Um, that's a great question. We're, we're continuing to try to find more information about that too and, and engagement. I think we have some follow-up links that we're sending out. We've been kind of focused on looking at resiliency factors and what um, kind of strength-based strength models to help families.